for years, Firebase has dominated the app developer space, but that may not be the case anymore. In this video, I'm going to show you five reasons that you should check out this Firebase alternative that you may have never heard of. What is up everyone? If you're new to the channel, my name is James Q Quick and I do weekly videos on web development related topics and I love to build stuff and I love all the tools that are out there that are changing the way we build stuff that enable us to build things quicker and faster. And I am a big advocate of the fact that I think there's never been a better time to be a developer. And that's going to lead us into AppRite, who is the sponsor of this video. And just know I never take on sponsors that I'm not excited about. And I think AppRite really fits the bill for technologies or platform or whatever you want to call it that enables us as developers to build more quicker, faster and better. So before we talk about AppRite, I think it's important that we take a few minutes to talk about Firebase and what it is, and then we can talk about how AppRite compares and the reasons to check out AppRite. So Firebase is a service that's been around for several years. It was bought by Google several years ago. And the cool thing about Firebase is that it has a bunch of different set of features all kind of packed into one. So they have database, they have real time uh, streaming updates for your database in the SDKs. They have SDKs. You can host, you can do serverless functions, you can do authentication. You can do a lot of this stuff inside of Firebase, but the one big downside that people see is that you're really locked into Google and the Firebase ecosystem. You don't really have choice of what kind of database is going on behind the scenes or where you're hosting this. And for some people that's great, but at a certain point you may need to have something that you have a lot more control over. And there's a little bit of an anecdote I want to share here, something about a technology called Parse. Now, Parse was a similar uh, platform to what Firebase is now, but almost 10 years ago, eight or nine, and it got acquired by Facebook and then Facebook shut it down. So for all of these people that were using Parse, all of a sudden they didn't have access to it anymore. And that's one of the big downsides about vendor lock-in. Not that Google is going away anytime soon, but you never know what they'll do with something like Firebase. So if you have control over the code, over the deployment, you have full control of your application going forward, regardless of what the company that owns the product is doing. All right, so now let's talk about what AppRite is. AppRite is a self-hosted, this is key, backend as a service platform that provides developers with all the core APIs required to build any application. Now this is really, really cool because it has a lot of the same feature set that Firebase has, but it also has the fact that you can host this yourself, have full control over it, and it's open source. So you get access to REST APIs, WebSockets, GraphQL is in the works. There's a Discord community with over 8,000 members, and there's 23,000 GitHub stargazers with 600 developers contributing to the project. So you know it's super active and people are really enjoying this. Now, I mentioned this being a self-hosted thing where you can go and self or host this wherever you want. There is also an option for a cloud option coming soon, later this year, where you'll be able to let this be hosted just inside of the AppRite platform. And you can sign up on their homepage for updates for the cloud offering and get free credits when it's available. But regardless of the cloud option coming soon, you'll still have the ability to help self host and control this in the future. And that leads into the number one point, I think of checking out AppRite is that ability to self host and deploy this. So if we look into the docs, into the installation docs, you can uh, run this with Docker. So all this stuff runs with Docker containers by the, behind the scenes. And if you're new to Docker containers, the promise there is that if you set up a container, it has all the dependencies that you might need so that when you deploy that container somewhere else, it's gonna work the exact same way. We've all been there as developers where we write a piece of code, test it on our machine, send it off, and then someone else tests and it doesn't work. And we say, well, it worked on my machine. The promise with Docker containers is that that never happens. So you get a couple of commands that you're actually just one command that you can run on your machine if you have Docker set up and you can have AppRite up and going in a couple of minutes, which is really, really nice. Now, a couple of additional options is to go ahead and deploy this to a service like DigitalOcean or Gitpod. So these both have one click installations, which is really nice. And then I got uh, my project set up on DigitalOcean with just a few minutes. So you can see I've got AppRite running in here. I've got a YouTube demo and I've got every, I've got access to everything fully controlled and managed on DigitalOcean. This is running on a $5 a month plan. So the hosting there is pretty cheap and you can kind of scale up from there as your application needs scale up as well. Now, one thing to note is I have the little dangerous flag marked up here, meaning this is not, this does not have an SSL certificate. 
this will actually be set up for you if you have your own domain that you use in the setup process. So AppRite, as you go through this setup, will take that domain, will generate your SSL, and it'll be totally secure and ready to go. I just didn't pay for a separate domain for this demo, although I could have, and that would be done really easily. All right, so just a reminder, there is a cloud offering coming soon where you can not worry about the hosting of this and still take advantage of the platform. But the big thing is you will always have access to hosting and maintaining this yourself so that you have complete control over your backend as a service and all of your code. Now, the second reason here is the fact that there is a really powerful GUI for or graphical user interface for setting up the database itself. You can create all of your different collection types. You can create the attributes. You can create indexes to help improve the performance of your database queries. You can all you can do all of that without having to write any SQL yourself. So that is actually one of my weaknesses. Even though I work for a database company, I don't really like doing database uh, setup using SQL because it's something I don't use on a daily basis and I'm not super, super comfortable with. So I want to just show you inside of the database tab here. Um, I've got a couple of different collections and these are both just to, uh, demos uh, to kind of show off here. But inside of post, I've got a title attribute and then a post type. Now, the cool thing about this is the post type is an enum. So uh, format here is enum and you can see that there's a couple of different values that you can select from. So if you only have a couple of different post types, creating an enum, make sure that every time I create a post, I only get one of those different types, tutorial, thought leadership, and top, thought, top list. Uh, just a couple of random things that I was thinking about. So if I wanted to attribute, add an attribute to this, I can add a new string and this will be author. And then I can have the size of this be 256, make this a required property, and then go ahead and create this inside of documents now i can go and create a new document and say this is another demo say post type is going to be tutorial the author now is going to be james q quick and then we have a permissions tab which we'll get into in a second but really really easy here to add the attributes to create your collections and then create your uh, individual documents as well in addition i mentioned you can create indices in here so if you want to speed up performance based on a certain query you can go and add your indexes right inside of here as well now one other really cool thing to note especially in compared to firebase with firebase you have no control over what the database is behind the scenes but you can actually customize that with AppRite, which is really exciting so with AppRite, you have the ability to work with mysql mariadb postgres and mongodb is coming soon so you have the ability to customize this and use whatever database you are most comfortable with, which is really nice. Now there's also built-in storage with the, I guess it's technically a separate feature, but it's still things that are being stored. But storage would be things like images or text files or whatever kind of items don't fit into the traditional relational database. You can store those in the storage option that they have in AppRite. Now, one of the most common examples of this is S3 in AWS, and you have the ability to customize where you store this stuff with AppRite as well. So you can use S3 and or Backblaze. Backblaze is actually the system I use for doing backups on my machine. So that's pretty cool to have that option too. You have support for uh, pagination in all of your database stuff. So you can group these so you're not overwhelming your database. And then back to the storage for all the files that you store, you have built-in encryption and virus scanning for all files. You have unlimited file sizes and you can do streaming. And then you can get image previews and optimization similar to what Cloudinary provides, which is really neat because we wanna make loading images into our application as performant as possible. So all in all, the database setup, the database, the storage, all that stuff is highly configurable, but then gives you a GUI to set the stuff up really easily and quickly. Now, I mentioned that we would get into the permissions section in a little bit, and now is the time to talk about number three, which is a robust user and permission system. So I wanna go over to the settings tab for this collection, this post collection. And if we scroll down, we'll see that there are permissions and you can have permissions at the collection level and then the document level. Now, this is really, really popular, or not popular. Now, this is really, really powerful because you can define who has access to what on an individual document level, and then maybe on an uh, uh, entire collection level. So if I only want myself to have access to post, but not have access to some sort of admin user information in the back end, then I can give myself only access to a certain collection, give other super admins access to everything. And again, you can do that at the document level as well. 
So what are some examples of these permissions that you can add for read and write access? Well, in the docs, they have a list of a ton of these permissions that you can tap into. So you can have different roles, you can have specific users, you can create teams. So if I wanted a team where I group a group of people into a certain team, then I could do permissions based on that. You can do a combination of team and role. You can have member. So this is a specifically logged in member. Then you can have a guest, someone that logs in just as a guest. This is a nice way to let someone onboard without creating an account, then go and create that account for them. And then lastly, is just role member where they're actually logged in. So this gives you the complete customization and control over all these different permissions that you might want to set on your data to make sure that only the right people have access to the right things. Now, one other thing I want to show you under the users tab is that you can define a bunch of different ways for your users to log in. So some of the built in stuff, email and password, email invite, magic URLs, which are becoming more and more popular, JWTs, JSON web tokens, anonymous with phone coming soon, in addition to all these other OAuth2 providers. So you can log in with Facebook and Gmail and Microsoft and whatever. You go to their site, configure your application, register those credentials inside of AppRite, and now it's ready to go where you can let people log in with all these different providers in your application that uses AppRite behind the scenes. Now, the fourth reason I think you should try out AppRite is because of the amazing SDKs that they have. Now, the first thing I noticed in looking through the list of SDKs that they have is that they have a lot of different options. So on the client SDKs, you have general web, you have Flutter, you have Apple and Android if you're doing native applications. Then if you're going on the server, you get into Node.js, Dino, PHP, Python, Ruby, Dart, Kotlin, and Swift. So many different languages that you can work with. And these SDKs have been crafted in a way where they feel really natural on the language and platform that you're actually using it in. So there's a lot of care that went into creating these SDKs to make sure that it's a natural experience for developers in a JavaScript ecosystem, in a PHP ecosystem, et cetera. So with these SDKs, you have access to all the functionality that you would want. You can do your CRUD operations, your create, read, update, and delete operations on your database records. You can do all of your authentication stuff, logging users in, logging them out, et cetera. And then you can also take advantage of the real-time updates with AppRite. Now, this is one of my favorite features where you can register a snippet inside of your code, listen for updates to a certain piece of data, and then be able to display on the, that on the screen if it's a real time chat application or something like that, the real time capabilities of this is really, really nice. It's a game changer. It's a super nice feature and it even works with your permission setup. So logged in users will only have access to updates on data that they should be able to see. So not only do you have your permissions set up to make sure if people are accessing stuff directly, that works, but it also works on the real time updates coming to the application itself. It only sends those updates to the right person or right people. Now, one additional thing I want to shout out about the real time stuff is that with Firebase, that only works with your regular database data, but in AppRite that works with each service, which includes your database, your storage, your auth and functions, which we'll talk about next. So all the real time updates for almost anything that goes on behind the scenes inside of AppRite, you can track that, you can listen for that inside of these SDKs. Now that leads me into our last feature that I think is worth checking out, which are serverless functions. Now serverless functions are one of my hottest topics in web development. I think they have been a game changer for how we build applications and how quickly and easy it is to build applications in the last couple of years. Typically what happens is instead of creating an entire server, you write a little function or however big a function you need, and then you give that to the host and they auto magically host it for you. And this magic happens. Now you have a backend endpoint where you can run some backend logic if you need it. Well, you have the ability to do that right inside of AppRite. So you can see on the AppRite functions page, there's several different environments that you can run uh, your functions in. So there's Node.js, PHP, Python, Ruby, Dino, Dart, and Swift. There's lots of those. There's a few other ones that are not enabled by default, but you have access to as well. So whatever language you want to write your serverless functions in, chances are you probably can. Now, one of the things that people often have concerns with are cold starts with serverless functions. And basically the idea is if you don't call a serverless function for a certain amount of time, that thing kind of goes to sleep. And the next time you call it, it has to wake back up. Uh, Heroku has been a very common example of this where it may take 20 seconds the first time you call that thing for it to wake back up and be, be available. So cool in here with serverless functions is that AppRite serverless functions have a cold start of about 100 milliseconds, which is very, very small. 
and then warm starts if it's already up and running at one millisecond. So you'll almost see no actual delays in calling these functions, even if they're starting up from scratch. Now I want to show you inside of the dashboard when we create one of these serverless functions, what do we have to customize? Well, you can give it a name. We'll just call this test function. And then inside of the settings, we can determine how we want this thing to be called. Now, this is really, really powerful because you can get you can tap into all of these different events from the app right dashboard. So users are getting created. Uh, membership is happening, files, deployments, collections, buckets, attributes, etc. You can uh, have those be events that then trigger the call of your serverless action. Extremely, extremely powerful. Now, another very special or very special option here is the ability to do cron syntax. Cron syntax allows you to define something to run every morning at 3 a.m., every hour on the hour, every fifth day of the week on 7 a.m. or whatever it is, you can customize your cron syntax to trigger something on some sort of regular cadence. Now, this is something I've struggled to find on other platforms because it's not something that's built into a lot of platforms. So I find this really unique and really, really powerful. An example I have is my learn, build, teach bot for my Discord runs every night at around midnight and it grabs a record from someone that shared something in the Discord and then shares that on my Twitter to help highlight the stuff that people have been doing. So the cron syntax to run something on a regular basis is a really, really neat feature that's built in here with AppRight. Now, I told you I'd give you five reasons why you should check out AppRight. I'm going to throw in one extra one. And it's the idea that AppRight really believes in open source. So we talked about AppRight being open source itself, except itself, how many people have contributed to it are active on it. But not only that, they also then actively support open source. So they have uh, recently announced their open source fund, which I thought was really special, a way to give back to open source maintainers and projects and fund them to a certain extent. So for each open source project that's chosen, they will get uh, funded with $2,500. So I just want to share that, yes, AppRight is open source and it's doing really well in terms of people committing and contributing to it, but also they're actively supporting the open source community. So going back to the general idea of having vendor lock in with Firebase, with AppRight, you've got this completely open source. You've got it funded and you've got it contributed to by the community. You have the ability to host it all yourself. You have access to database and storage and auth in real time, a bunch of different SDKs, all these things are all amazing reasons to check out AppRight. So if you have already, let me know what you think in the comments below. If you haven't, go and check it out and then come back and let me know in the comments below. Hope you enjoyed the video and I'll catch you in the next one.